Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club. In this week's episode, I'm thrilled to be joined with the brilliant voice actor and audiobook narrator RJ Bailey. RJ, thank you so much for joining me on the show. How are you today? I'm very good, thank you. Um, I'm feeling... That's very nice of you to say. Um, it's very hot in my studio with my noise-proof blackout curtains closed, surrounded by insulation, but I'm I'm doing very good, thanks. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well, thank you. I was just going to say it looks super cosy in your in your space. I actually call it the cosy box these days. Oh, do you? So like, yeah, yeah, I'm coming into my cosy box. <laughs> I uh, I built it, all of this padding and stuff myself when I moved yeah. here uh, a year and a half ago, and it's it was Baltic until I put all of this insulation in. Um, and it and made these acoustic panels and now it's almost too hot in the summer months I have to say yeah yeah it's getting uh, it's getting sort of deadly at this weather mine's mm. um I've got a uh, it's like a kitted out a kitted out two person sauna it was originally and then we sort of <laughs> gutted it and then put all the insulation in and made it sort of yeah. into a booth uh, and that is I mean it was supposed to be hot before obviously so now it's <laughs> yeah. got the insulation it's uh it's extra good unbearable <laughs> um, yes yeah, so lovely so so now if we may i'd love to start um right at the very beginning can you tell mm. us a little bit about your background uh, and how you got started in the world of uh, voiceover and audiobooks yeah so i started um about six and a half years ago now um full time i just jumped in with both feet um that was originally because and i know that's not normal but that was originally because I was bouncing around jobs, um, not happy with any of them. Um, and my depression has always been quite bad. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and in 2016, um, I got I was diagnosed with diabetes and my depression as a result of that got so bad. I had to go off sit work sick because um, yeah. I was having I was in a, quite a long term psychosis. Okay. You know, I, I couldn't read English and. Or, or speak English and and I was essentially a glorified um, call center worker so like not really being able to communicate or see my own notes wasn't wasn't ideal for the job right. so I went off long-term sick for a while and eventually I was off for so long I lost my job and um, I was uh, applying for when I was well enough I was applying mm. for all these other jobs and um, that I didn't really want and <laughs> then getting knocked back for them so I was applying for jobs I didn't want and then feeling bad because I wasn't offered them anyway yeah. and I kind of viewed my time as building blocks of time if if every hour was a brick what I was doing was like putting these bricks down into doing a proper you know job application which takes mm -hmm. a lot of time and research sure, and then yeah. when when you ha when you are rejected you just throw all those bricks away um and so it was my now wife suggested to me, uh, one of her friends did uh, audiobooks on ACX. And she was like, why don't you just try giving that a go? And I do, you know, I've been, I had done community radio in the past. Yeah. So I had a rudimentary um, microphone, I, uh, a Zoom H1N. I knew my way around Audacity and a little bit of editing and stuff and mastering. And so I was like, well, I could get all these bricks and throw them away or I could get all these bricks. And as I build something, I could just keep them because I'm building something that no one can reject. So, yeah, that's how I got into it. Basically, I didn't have any training. I didn't really know what <laughs> what I was doing, but I was needed money. So I was yeah. just went on to ACX and I luckily got the second book I auditioned for. Um, and then I was just and then I got a. I had written, I've, I've written quite a lot um, on websites and stuff. And, uh, mm. you know, I had a magazine column and things. And um, a director actually was like, well, you gave me a, you gave my film a nice review. Well, I'm working on a commercial. So how about we use you as the test VO for this commercial? And um, I can just suggest to them that, you know, the, the head honchos, if you like the VO, then just keep the test guy and we'll pay him. Mm. So uh, that's what happened. And it was Johnson and Johnson um nick nick jr nick tunes and nick three different nickelodeon channels yeah and bath times are sponsored by johnson and johnson and uh and so that was in the space of a couple of weeks and i got wow. paid you know pretty good money for it yeah and so i was like this is easy mate put my foot <laughs> spent it went to loads of like heavy metal concerts bought loads of like video game i was like this is the why wouldn't i done this years ago 
And then obviously, like, that did not occur again <laughs> for, for a long time. So I was like, that's weird. I got all this stuff straight away. And I thought, like, oh, you've got to, like, properly work at it, have you? Uh, but that's how I got into it. Yeah, I, I was fortunate enough to be diagnosed with a chronic illness. <laughs> what? <that's... laughs> Basically. Wow, that is a that is an in- really interesting route into it. So you were yeah. so am I right? you say that your 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 wife's friend was an audiobook narrator. Yeah, yeah, someone she knew, and he just do it did it like part time. It wasn't his full time inclo- yeah. income, but it was someone she knew did it. So I and I I've always loved art. I've always loved movies. Um, mm. So and a lot of the um movies that i love were are continue to be like superhero movies and mm. so if you think about it the vocal performances especially in villains in superhero movies are iconic like everyone you know just look at the dark knight you know look at yeah. joker uh, heath ledger's joker look at um tom bane at uh, tom bane tom hardy <laughs> yeah. tom hardy is bane you know look at um even you know i love batman the animated series mark hamill yeah. arguably best voiceover of all time kevin conroy yeah. is batman you know so um and i used to rep you know willem defoe is amazing his voice in um as green goblin so yeah. all of these things, I was just like, I used to imitate them anyway in my own time. So I, I was, and being re- presenting on the radio, a lot of veterans will go, oh, it's very, you know, very different and stuff. But I, maybe it was a, just an idiosyncratic style I had on the radio mm. of doing skits and stuff and liking to sound yeah. dramatic that I just kind of naturally did when I was telling a story. So yeah, that's, that's, that's how I got into it. And those, yeah. So those you, are my inspirations and stuff yeah so have you always like been into performing or was it just through like the love of this this media like these characters and things did you did you kind of know that you enjoyed performing before or was or did you just get sort of uh, hooked into this this medium and then then they kind of discovered that you enjoyed imitating the voices I, and such i always liked it i when i was in secondary school i took film uh, no i took theater studies mm. and when i was um at university i studied film um and then i studied um screenwriting to a master's level um yeah. and that's all worked out so well hasn't it but, uh, but i do it, it must have played some influence yeah. on me because it's all storytelling uh so yeah i i did love the idea of performing and i liked acting in mm-hmm. the school plays that i was in mm-hmm. um but i always was like well i better study to be a writer or a, a producer or something because I'm not important enough or I'm not a, a marked one. I'm not a, a blessed one who could go on to be a successful actor. And I've, I'm, despite how I might come across sometimes, I'm like actually a big old introvert. So yeah. I was all, like quite shy of seeing mistakes and I, I feel very ashamed if I do things wrong. So mm-hmm. I was like, well, your your job is to be looked at as an actor. And I don't want to be looked at in case everything goes wrong so when i stumbled into audiobook narration and voice acting i was able to do the performance stuff but in a, a really like in my joggers and t-shirt kind of way yeah um it's you know and um if any no one's ever going to hear my mistakes essentially i mean they always creep through but like mm. i'm able to go through everything i've done and just pick out the mistakes and do it again before anyone hears it so yeah. there's no kind of like shame to <laughs> i understand to aspect to it yeah i get that completely uh, and i agree i think i really i relate to that a lot <laughs> um I, do you think that you know going into this endeavor and because there is a an element of, of putting yourself out there constantly mm. you have to you know to keep up um consistent work and such has that affected has that improved your confidence would you say at all has has getting behind the mic over all these years sort of yeah, affected abs- that i would say so yeah and i don't want to sound terribly big-headed but this might do and i apologize and i already <laughs> cringe um at it but i always wanted to be someone who had a cool job yeah and like people think it's cool that I'm a voice actor like and I always wanted people to be interested I suppose in what I did yeah. um and and like 
it's it's a big confidence boost to go into a room and know that you've probably got one of the most interesting vo- uh, uh, jobs in there. And yeah. it's nice for me to know, to my self-esteem and my fragile ego, to know that, like, I've got a job that I think is cool. And I, uh, I know that other people think it's cool. So that's a big boost to me. It's almost like I don't have to naturally have confidence. I've I've got... I, I've artificially gained confidence purely by having something interesting to talk about that I do for a living. Does that make sense? I would dare any any voice artist, any narrator, to disagree with that. I think that's <laughs> I think that's a part of you, and I think also this. Yeah, I think maybe it is an ego thing, and maybe you know. But when you go and you, and you talk about it, you sort of almost create this mystique about yourself because yeah, there's kind yeah. of two reactions, I guess. The first one is that they might not know what that is. Mm-hmm. Um, they might not know, or you know, they don't even. It's not something that somebody immediately thinks. Oh, that's a job that somebody actually does. Yeah, um, which is always kind of exciting to say, you know, to explain. Mm-hmm. And then you have the people who, oh, I, I listen to audiobooks all the time. I didn't, yeah, you know. um, yeah, definitely it does um, create that kind of excitement about yourself. I think um, there's also a got- third reaction which I experience uh, occasionally, which is the trying not to be impressed. <laughs> uh, reaction sometimes people occasionally can be a bit like oh, so what no like yeah don't impress me mate um yeah. which i enjoy also i do get a kick out of that as well because <laughs> um because i'm like well if you're like that then you're probably a little bit petty so you yeah. deserve to feel the way you do yeah yeah, it's, I think the only danger there is that when you go, if you go to a gathering or a party or you know some element where you, you're talking about uh, yourself, and then somebody else comes up yeah. and says, oh, "I'm a snowboard instructor" or something like that, and you go, yeah, yeah, damn, <laughs> god <laughs> damn it, <laughs> no. <laughs> so um, you you work with the BBC, uh, Nick Junior Talksport, uh, Smooth Radio, uh, to name just a few. Um, mm-hmm. Now, a huge part of our audience are, are fairly new to the industry and, and dream of working with names uh, such as those. Could you maybe tell us a little bit how um, you became sort of linked with those clients uh, and, and maybe what working for those big names kind of involves? I know you've already mentioned uh, the Johnson & Johnson one. Mm-hmm. Well, that yeah. that was actually quite some time ago in my past, actually. That was more early days, funnily yeah. enough. But I, it's because I was doing community radio at the time. And so I, um, I, I, I was unhappy with a job yet again. Mm-hmm. Um, so I saw that they were ad, and I was like, "Well, I do radio now. I've got some experience." So yeah. I saw a job advertised um, for a company, which I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say, um, because I, a lot of these organisations, I think, pretend they do it themselves, but mm-hmm. actually, it's an organisation that does it for them. So I got one job, and essentially started appearing on. Travel Radio Scotland and BBC London and um, the other ones that you mentioned that I can't remember <laughs> now. Um, and I would read the traffic and travel. Um, yeah. But also um, it would be, a lot of it would be pre-recorded. So it would be, you know, with a very, not like way in advance because it had to be reactive, but it yeah. was a file I would record. I would ma- edit and master quickly. And then I would send off to a radio station and they would play it as though it was live or um, as though yeah. uh, they did it themselves. So essentially it was doing voiceover um, readings, like news. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Like, yeah, it's like a combination of journalism and voiceover. Um it's in its own kind of little character. I suppose you'd call it non-fiction narration, I suppose. Yeah, um, I suppose it is, yeah. Uh, and uh, that's how I got started doing doing it for those people, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I I essentially looked for a job, and I appreciate that's not the normal way of going about things, but I looked for a job uh, and got the job um, and did that yeah. part-time as well. Um, yeah. And um, through doing that, you know, I've done a bit of, arts correspondence for bbc radio scotland uh, mm-hmm. not voiceover but you know going in and reviewing things but as a re- uh, being a voice actor allowed me a bit of like credibility that they might want to talk to me um, yeah as, as someone who's a f- professional artist um as, you see how i stagger over that as well that's the that's the uh <laughs> that's the uh, lack of confidence coming in yeah um so yeah that's that's how i got on board with that basically 
Well, I think it's really, I think it's really important as well for people to know that there's so many different avenues. Um, Absolutely, into it. it's not just one sort of thing. Mm. Would you? Here's one. Did you? Do you? Would you advise? Would you suggest? Like you know, narrators who want to, you know, um, or people who want to get into narration, people who want to get into voiceover. Would you suggest them sort of having a look into community radio as a as an avenue for gaining experience and things like that? Yeah, I mean, I don't see why not. You're going to be, um, it's going to make you eminently more comfortable with your own voice uh, mm-hmm. coming out of a microphone and into your own ears um, <sighs> through your headphones. Um, it's going to just get you really um, comfortable with audio equipment. And I think it's going to be a real confidence booster. And I think that's what a lot of it is. It's just going to boost your confidence, boost your comfort with working with that kind yeah. of stuff, working with microphones. You'll learn the mechanics of how microphones work, what an interface is, what which bit connects to which other bit through what kind of XLR cable. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I I personally would. And it's just a huge amount of fun as well. Um, you know, and you make good contacts. You know, I've not only made friends that are still my friends there, uh, sorry, now, but also, um, you know, I made good contacts with magazines um, and, and things like that when I was speaking to uh, writers and editors who were guests on my talk show. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, a, you know, you could well be. I didn't do it with a mind to having voiceover as a career at that time. But in hindsight, if I knew, um, that could be a great marketing tool. Certainly mm-hmm. the amount of people you'd come into contact with. Um, yeah, I would really recommend it. Yeah, I think because, um, again, I don't think we've spoken before on this show about radio. Um, mm-hmm. And how that, um, which it seems strange as well, because it's kind of all connected, isn't it? It's all the same. You usually yeah. find that you know people in all those different spheres are usually interested in each other, in each other's paths. Absolutely, um, I think that's um, yeah, it's super interesting. Uh, I'm mm-hmm. quite, I'm quite interested in that, going down that avenue myself, just for um, a little bit of fun, to be honest. Um, it's great so, fun. So, what, um, what's a typical day? like in the studio for you are you are you narrating all day have you got a, a sort of a rigid schedule how, how do you how do you fit it all in what's a typical day i'm quite a holistic kind of mm, worker mm. um i don't like work life separation um yeah. i like to go and do stuff that i feel like doing and obviously necessity dictates that i feel like making money so i have to go and work but <laughs> You know, if I want to go and walk the dogs in the morning, I try and stay flexible because my wife is a, you know, she works at home and that's pretty mm-hmm. flexible as well. But it's not as she, she works for um, BBC Maestro, which is a, yeah. a recent thing um, for her. And um, is that the she's a class. Um, yeah, master class yeah. type thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so she's fairly flexible, but I like to be even more flexible. You know, we have two dogs. One of them's a rescue and she can be a little bit funny she's a very yeah. nice girl but obviously she's got you know trouble emotional troubles unfortunately poor girl because she comes yeah. from romania so you know she, if she's feeling a bit funny or um if other things need doing it's just nice to have that flexibility and i've got my own studio building essentially in the guard uh, garden that i come into um so i wake up um w- like about I mean, I've been waking up very early because I'm doing a lot of work at the moment, but yeah. often about 8, 8.30, um, have my breakfast, take the dogs out for a walk and then settle in for some uh, narration. Um, yeah. Because my voice doesn't warm up really. I just don't think I'm as good in the earlier hours. So I tend to work later. And if yeah. I want to work very late into the night... I like that flexibility of going, well, I can have a bit of a lie-in tomorrow because I was up till one working or something yeah. like that. So it's really not structured at all. Um, and I don't think I'm very good in a structured environment, which is why I was just not suited to like nine to five kind of jobs. Yeah. Um, I think they're really tough. I think it's really tough to be that structured. It is for me. Yeah. So that's why I have this kind of like, you know life that kind of like is a venn diagram really um of two almost overlapping completely overlapping circles where i can work when i want to and take breaks when i want to yeah Uh, so yeah i come into the studio and then you know fanny about on the internet wasting time for a little bit replying to social media 
um, chatting to my friends, looking at like, you know, uh, Warhammer community website page, <laughs> uh, checking out um, what horror movies are coming out, uh, leaving comments on Metal Injection. And then, uh, and then I do some work. Yeah, settle in and do some work. And I work yeah. about an hour at a time. So mm. I do an hour's narration and then I go and have a little break and then I mm. come back and do another hour's narration. And I work out what my deadlines are. So um, if I've got a, a book, um, I work out, you know, I go through it at the start of a project. I see how many pages there are as opposed to how many there are on the book because obviously you're not counting all of the words afterwards, the pages afterwards. Yeah, I yeah. see how many chapters there are. And then I divide it by chapters over how many days I've got left. And then I know I need to do that many chapters per day. Yeah. Um, it's not like going to work out every day would be the same because sometimes you get short days with short chapters and some days you get long days with long chapters. Yeah. But otherwise, I'm just ending a chapter in the middle of it and then going to bed or something. So... Um, I can't be doing that. So I, um, yeah, I just go by how many chapters I need to accomplish a day, basically. And yeah. that's it. Um, and then I know I need a certain amount of time. I don't know how long the book is, you know, but maybe a week, uh, a week and a half, two weeks, depending on how long the, if the book's really long, to edit it, proof it, edit it, master it. Um, but I'm very fortunate at the moment because I've started doing a lot of work with a newish company called audiobook empire um and so i'm getting my uh proofing editing and mastering outsourced by the production company oh, and nice, i just yeah. have to worry about narrating and let me tell you oh my god that's a dream like if there's anyone new listening that's something to aspire to my friends just don't <laughs> don't do any of that back end stuff unless you enjoy it but like to just be able to just do the narration and then let someone else take care of everything else is <laughs> oh it's such a delight i've done that quite a bit recently and then i went and did a book um that i did myself that wasn't with uh, audiobook empire mm -hmm. and i love the book series um it's called the vanguard chronicles um uh, second book's almost coming out soon the hand that casts a bone um, but I had to go and master, you know, do all the post-production of that mm. myself. And it was a bit of a shock to the system after having just to enjoy narrating something to then proof yeah. it all, edit it all, master it all. Yeah. And while I loved the book, it does get a slog. No matter what book it is, I find that to be a slog, especially having not not having done it for a while. So, yeah, yeah that, there's a real motivating goal for people, I think. <laughs> I uh, do, do you know it's 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 shocking me how similar we are. Um, yeah. I um I do with the working out the chapters and then putting the chapters rather than the length of the chapters per day. That's exactly how I do it as well. I uh -huh. much prefer to um sort of say okay, well this is my list what I've got to get done today. Um, yeah. And I, I don't have a, a specific time. I just get it done when I want to do it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that's more. I don't know. It sort of helps. Um, if it's not too sort of knobby to say about this i sort of helps the creative you know be creative yeah. and things like that yeah um, totally um i think uh yeah and i know exactly what you mean about the uh, the editing as well because my sister's a, a sound engineer um mm -hmm. so and we sort of started this venture together i was narrated audiobooks and then i'd pass it on to her and she'd do everything and uh, i didn't realize how lucky i kind of was yeah. you know just <laughs> walking into the uh, you know it just it's just sitting in the booth doing my silly voices and sending it off yeah. and you know taking uh taking a, a good rate for it and thinking i'm all yeah. lit and then um i started working with the uh, with pro audio voices and they needed some help uh with their post-production i volunteered yeah i can do that of course i can uh -huh. um and although i loved it i love the projects i love the narrators all wonderful people um and it's an absolute blast um but yeah the, the post-production is definitely not as fun in my opinion as the actual narration no <laughs> like, <laughs> out of you and your sister you've definitely got the best uh the best <laughs> outcome of that one absolutely it's telling yeah. stories is a treat people do yeah. it for fun people gather around campfires doing it so yeah like why wouldn't you just want to do the narration people do that yeah. for free so yeah, yeah. You're on the cover of the book sometimes. Your little yeah. name. <laughs> I have a welcome pack that I send out to people and I'm like I would like my name on the cover of the book. And I literally say, due to my fragile ego, I would like my name on the cover of the book. Thanks yeah. very much.
<laughs> yeah, I think I did. I think I did about right at the start. I've been I've been narrating for about uh, I was gonna say fifteen years, but about, about, about five and a half years now. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I did about about ten titles before my name was on the cover of one. I was so excited. <laughs> 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 me too. Me too. You've yeah. done way more than me. I looked up your stuff. You've done loads of stuff. I'm really impressed. <laughs> Oh, thanks. I mean, He's, I've uh, only done like fifty books, maybe <laughs> over. You know, I mean, I I do a lot of commercial work and stuff like mm. that, which, you know, as you probably are aware, yeah, pays vastly better yeah. than um, audio books. So that's how I keep myself going. But I'd rather, um, I'd rather have the more audio books to my ty- to my name. I have to say. So I was very impressed when I saw how many you'd done. I think um, I don't know. It's, it was kind of. I never really set out to do to do that. I, I never really sort of set out with a specific target and stuff. It was just uh-huh. I was I we just had this sort of rule where if 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 the sort of jobs are there and we can sort of support ourselves, we'll do it. And it just yeah. um, ended up being that that was because I've I've done way more um, audiobook narration work than I have done voiceover. Um, uh-huh. I've done I've done quite like scarily little um, compared to like you know uh, to others who are uh, who mm-hmm. are sort of more fifty fifty. Um, yeah. So it just sort of worked out that way, and I think. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you. I was going to ask you. Um, I'll move on to this question actually because it's more relevant. Um, but as a British performer, um, I, I, I found that around kind of. I don't know. It might be subjective to me. I, I'm not sure. But I found about eighty percent of my work is me working in some variation of a US accent, um, whether that's kind of you know just general American or Southern or, or New York sort mm. of um, thing. Have you found yourself having to do much accent work over the years? And if and if so, how do you prepare for that? I do do accent work. However, mm. um, I haven't done that many books in, like, say, a US accent. Mm. I can do a US accent pretty well, but, like, that's not terribly hard um, for a British person, I'd say, given yeah. if you are inclined to do voiceover and stuff due to just the amount of media we absorb. Yeah. But, um, yeah, yeah. Um, for a long time, I didn't actually audition for it because I just thought, well... There's other um, American voice actors out there so who are going to have a more authentic accent than me. Yeah. So I just pursued, like, English uh, yeah. or, or British kind of... You know, I live in Scotland. I can do a pretty good general Scottish or Edinburgh Scottish accent. So, um, yeah, I, I di- didn't really pursue it. I have done some under a pseudonym, um, like romance stuff, hmm. Um but and I got some, um, you know, some pointers from my American producers. Um, but no, I haven't done a great deal fully in another accent. Like I, when I started out, there was a fantasy book I did um, called Warper, um, mm. Warper, and I did the sequel. Um, and uh, and so I auditioned for it, and I was like, okay, br- great. It's that's a fantasy book. I've got a British accent. That's how it works. So I was like, auditioned in a British accent. And then they rejected me, but it was still on, um, still up for audition. So I was like, right, I'll try it again. Like, did it with a different kind of British accent. I think I g- gave it the old Game of Thrones thing. <laughs> didn't didn't like it. And then, I, because the accent was unspecified as well on ACX, right. where they can list what a- accents they want. And then yeah. after I auditioned again, they changed it to American. So I was like... Oh, okay. So I did it as an American accent and got it. Um, and those nice. are very early books of mine. Um, but no, I've just kind of pursued... Um, yeah, I've just kind of pursued um, uh, British stuff. However, in the last couple of years, I did audition for a book that I really wanted to do. And I didn't get it. And an Amer- It was for a British accent. Mm-hmm. And an American voice actor got it. Um, and I personally you know and i'm not good at some accents myself but <laughs> i didn't find it a massively convincing mm. english accent and i didn't get the book so i was like oh that's oh I'll, I'll, I'll if if that's that'll do then i'll start auditioning for american ones again <laughs> because if he got that one yeah. Doing that accent, I can get American ones doing an American <laughs> accent. So only in the last year or two have I started o- auditioning again for American stuff. So that yeah. was a real positive, in a way, 
to not yeah. to miss out on that audiobook. Yeah, and you asked when it comes to preparing for mm. accents. Um, I, I think I'm at the risk of sounding, you know, a bit, you know, knobby. Um, <laughs> I think I'm naturally inclined, like quite good at naturally picking up accents and doing accents anyway. Yeah. Um, but when I go in, I I don't really do you know i haven't trained under anyone i just like go and like listen to youtube videos that i believe are authentic and are telling me the correct information and there's lots of how to speak in a such and such accent out there um and so i listen to the you know i do the exercises to teach myself how to do the accent um i listen to media of that mm. kind of accent you know um if i'm doing um Ghanaian I'll try and find some Ghanaian media to do to kind of replicate it um and also like listen to the videos so the videos are good because they'll teach you how to shape your mouth and how to move your tongue and stuff like that and then you want to hear it used in a casual context when people aren't talk people aren't thinking about their how their accent works they're just talking and so yeah. that's how I do it basically um so I'm able to kind of pick them up like that I suppose yeah. And I've got quite a wide variety now. And thankfully, um, there's only seems to be ever a certain amount of um, accents that people put in their books anyway. Like I've done, yeah. you know, a fair amount between my normal name and my s couple of other pseudonyms. And it's, you know, I've yet to come across like a... Um, I suppose like Easter Island accent or like a, even like Argentinian stuff like that. Yeah. Like there aren't, you know, or, um, or Lao things like that. Like yeah. I, I never come across them in books for some reason. So yeah, I'd I, say, uh, yeah, I would agree. I think usually for, for me, the, the majority are just either sort of general British and then obviously yeah. maybe a smattering of, um, across the States maybe mm. kind of i've had a few it's kind of vaguely european which of course could mean quite a lot of things um, yeah yeah but the uh sort of that but yeah you're right it still seems to be you know, i guess that's the market isn't it as well you know um you've got to write for the market that are gonna yep. be buying these books and we just so happen to be working in this market who are yeah you know, the sort of west i guess um it's kind of uh it's weird because i i only started doing american um books because one of the first ones um uh, that I got needed like a Brit they needed one narrator to do uh, two characters an American general American accent and a general mm -hmm. British accent and I thought okay well this seems like you know because as you say it, it seems to be more British it, it seems to be easier for British to do Americans than Americans to do Brit it seems to yeah be. I've heard yeah. that quite a few times not sure why I've heard that um so I thought okay well this is my chance I wanted someone kind of like young adulty you know uh, young mm. adult sounding so I thought I'd give it a go and then I tried really hard and my American accent worked and it sent in this audition got the book did the book but then sort of paid very little um sort of attention to my British voice I just, I'll just do me I'll just do yeah my sort of normal voice maybe posh it up a little bit try and get the leads out of it a little bit and yeah. uh, do sort of general standard and uh, the first review when it came out and stuff the top review was oh the guy can't do a British accent <laughs> <laughs> I had the same thing in Warper <laughs> Same thing, exactly the same thing. And so you can take that as a compliment because Warper was that fantasy book I did in an American accent. And I was like, well, I'll toss some British accents in there to give myself an easier time. Yeah. And it's a fantasy book, you know, and these are people yeah. from different countries so I can give them a British accent. I get the same thing, terrible British accent, awful. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that must be really convincing American accent then. That's pretty good. He just sort of come away going, I can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we, I'm just sorry, I'm just uh, double checking uh, on, on time. And I do want to uh, get to a, a few things that I think are, are super important to uh, mm -hmm. chat about. Now, we chatted before about um, uh, topics we'd like to cover during the show. Uh, and you mentioned a really important issue that I think um, is vital to touch upon. Um, yeah. Now, on this show, we make a, an active effort to ask inclusive questions uh, and create a welcoming atmosphere um, for anyone. Um, but that's not always something that's uh, shared across the board, unfortunately. Um, now, you have had some um, experience with um, yeah. unpleasant and possibly sort of aggressive bullying behaviour um, yeah. from members of uh, th this community. Um, yeah. Would you be able to speak a, a little about this um, 
uh, uh, and and what we can do as members of this industry uh, to make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen yeah i think um it, it was definitely more prevalent and i'm seeing definitely a lot of change which is absolutely wonderful and heartwarming but especially when i got into it about six years ago maybe a bit you know six and a half years ago whatever that was mm -hmm. um I was told, you know, when I would listen to podcasts on the subject, you know, because I was trying to absorb as much VO info as possible. Mm -hmm. I was told, you know, by everyone, it's the friendliest industry. It's the friendliest industry you'll ever be in. It's just everyone is lovely to each other. And so I got into um, Facebook groups, you know, asking to join them all. And mm -hmm. so I started... Um, I, I would, you know, I would sit and lurk for a while, but occasionally, like when people would go, oh, how, do, you know, someone would ask a question, how do you tackle this? And so I would, if it was something I thought I could do, I would go like, oh, he, I'd suggest a way of doing it. This is how I do it, mm -hmm. or you could use this or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, a an, an newbie, um, very not confident. Like, you know, I, I haven't had a terrible lot of confidence in the past. And, mm -hmm. um, and people would just like pile on me with like um you know unpleasant like just like even this didn't happen to me but i saw someone like saying hey this is how i've set my microphone up you know because i had to do it in a pinch and someone who is um you know i i someone who's been doing it a long time replied saying amateur just full stop you know and and just similar things like that and this was a new person who wanted yeah. to share their kind of like enthusiasm for it and and there were a lot of people and the same thing would happen to me i can't remember because i checked out of these groups a long time ago because i was having a horrible time in them so yeah. i was like no i'm not not participating but i got similar things where it would just be like don't do that that's the wrong you know that's yeah. a, you know that's a stupid thing to do you know hostile denigrating language that would you know remark mm. upon like clearly you're a new person clearly yeah. you don't know what you're doing blah 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 you know like just belittling kind of stuff and i think there's a certain demographic of people um who who don't believe that they think internet life is not real life what you do on the internet isn't real and it perhaps isn't the real you and maybe it's not the real you but it does Maybe for people like me or um, a millennial or younger yeah. people who are digital natives, like that line is not like distinct. Like we express our personality and that comes out online and we, we have friendships with people uh, online. And I've met mm -hmm. people online who I've then gone on to be real good friends with mm -hmm. um, in real, you know, in real life. I know I'm yeah. <laughs> doing it there myself, but you know, like, so we, we interact with people perhaps in the way that's, um, you know, and people like me do anyway, interact with people in a way that's authentic and is, is as though you're talking to someone in the street. Um, and a lot of people would pile on and, and would be, it would be like someone coming up to you in the street and going, you're stupid. You don't know what you're doing. What on earth, what the F is that? Like, yeah, yeah. you know, um, and it, as someone with de depression, it really felt like whenever I would look at these things, these groups, it felt like almost like a physical weight pushing down on my head, pushing down on my shoulders, like just really affecting my depression and making it really bad. It used to get me like, um, give me like tension headaches and stuff right. and make yeah. me feel fuzzy in the head. And, you know, I don't care if they want to call me a snowflake nowadays for saying that but that's how i feel i found it hostile and if it was you know and i spoke to other people um and there was one particular facebook group and um just i saw someone being piled on and someone who was a new person spoke up and said you're being quite bullying like what is going with the bullying here and i was like yeah can can f it i don't know if i'm allowed to swear but yeah, i was like <laughs> i was like yeah fuck it let's go then let's get stuck in let's burn some bridges so like i i got stuck in and was just like saying why are you, you know stop bullying people this is yeah. ridiculous you know and eventually we just all left that group a bunch of us left that group um and set up our own little group um 
But yeah, it, and it just was like really unpleasant behavior and you don't need it at all in your life. The most important aspect of it is the kind of like emotional stuff. Why? Why, you know, like why, why make someone feel shit when you're delivering information? Like mm-hmm. you can deliver information in a way that encourages and helps and makes someone feel good. You know, I've seen on, you know, one of these, you know, someone who, who was a bit of a bully, I saw, uh, you know, they would on one of their profiles would say that they were blunt and it was like as though that's a good thing and yeah. i'm like if you're blunt that's a character flaw to be worked upon that shows that you can't deliver information in a in a in a companionable you know good yeah, yeah, yeah. agreeable way like it's sh- it's a shortcoming as far as i'm concerned um so yeah it was it was no one needs that emotion you know negative emotions in their life people don't know what you're going through in your own life people like me who are on a lot of medication for depression still don't need that in their life you know you have no idea what's going on you know don't be the person that pushes someone over the edge be the person that makes them smile perhaps or go oh very helpful um the other thing is it's totally counterproductive because you know the people who i saw giving unpleasant behavior would say that's terrible for the industry you're 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 bringing rates down like mm. you're really damaging the industry by doing this you're doing bad things you're doing bad you're awful you're bad you know stop yeah. destroying our livelihoods yeah, yeah. getting getting angry about it so that's counterproductive because what i would do is i'd get that kind of stuff and then i would not want to participate in that because it made me feel shit And I would go and want to work stuff out for myself. And that's how I've been now. And I quite like it now. Just work, just figuring stuff out for myself. Being a little hermit. Like, (laughs) so, but I'm sure I did a lot of things early on as a result of not, you know, wanting to interact with people who made me feel bad. Mm -hmm. I'm sure as a result of that, I went and did a load of stuff that brought prices down, like they said, damaged the industry, like they said. You know, because... No one was telling me otherwise because I didn't want to be told otherwise because it would make me feel crap and it would make my depression worse. So yeah. I would go and do all these things they don't like being done because they had been unpleasant. It was their own doing for me to go and then do those things. So it's not just about Im- the emotional welfare of your fellow human being, though I do contend that is by far the most important part. The yeah. other part is it's counterproductive and you are you're you are subverting your own aims you're having the opposite effect you want because people aren't gonna interact with you and get this advice from you yeah and, and I, that's that's I, why I, I think it's important i uh, I, I couldn't agree more um i've seen uh, i've seen in those facebook groups as well people just get piled on in the comments and it's yeah. it's bully there's no way about it if a group of people yeah. all started shouting at you on the yeah. street no you know you wouldn't stand for it or people would help but on facebook yeah. that makes it okay and of course it's not um yeah and imagine the thing that used to get me was that you'd see like people being very aggressive in the comments and, and, and you know giving them you know you're doing this wrong you need to do it like this yeah. and i'd be like no that's wrong as well that's not even yeah. good advice yeah um, totally because there's so many different different ways to do it it's not one size fits all with every project there's so many no. different ways of narration there's so many different ways of prepping your script there's so many different ways of scheduling your day yeah and so yeah and um, you must do this you must do yeah. that and it's like this is art like it wouldn't be art if there was only one way of doing it like that's not how art works it's not a scientific process there are best practices there are ways of achieving desirable results that many people like however it's an art if you discover a new way of doing it that's great and i want to learn that new way to do, you know, to have another uh, string yeah. to my bow, you know, another fe- yeah. feather in my cap. Art, it's not, it's not a mechanical process mm-hmm. that you know. I don't know, you know, maybe this is yeah. me, like, make you know, building psychologies of people who I didn't know <laughs> at all. But I was, when I was like in that bad place, being you know bullied, and then you know online, and like you know, it wasn't consistent bullying by one person harassing me onwards and onwards. But it would be the same people making comments. And I feel like they would just do that to everyone. It wasn't personalized at me. Um, So I don't know if that makes it worse or better. But anyway, they would go like, 
no don't do that you must do this you have to do that um you're doing it wrong right. and i i always was like well let's like if he why should and they'll be they would say you, your audio will sound shit and mm. i would think well i haven't heard their audio what if it sounds great because i remember one incident when someone said oh i managed to complete this in like such and such hours and another person said that takes 12 hours to do <laughs> like you you know you're doing it wrong yeah and to me like my reaction is you can do that in 6 hours i could save z- let me have a listen let me judge for myself and if i've got if you've got a way of doing this in 6 hours and getting the same results tell me cuz yeah. i'm making more money then my friend and yeah. if not you know that's fine but i'm not just going to why should i assume you're lying you know that that you've done it in six hours and but your audio sounds crap like i let me find that out for myself i'll be the judge of that without you know when i hear it not when not yeah. not just on the basis that I, i'm incapable of something therefore yeah. it must be wrong yeah it, to me you know it was like people were just so maybe they'd been doing it so long and done so many hundreds and hundreds of books that it was like they just like I don't know jaded or lost their passion in my head this was this might not be how it was at all but it was like they've got their mechanical process and they do it that way and maybe they just don't want to explore anymore maybe they just don't want to push the boundaries of what can be done anymore yeah. um and so that's that's a shame personally I wouldn't want to be like that but mm-hmm. I don't think it's right for you to then go there you know I think it's flawed thinking to go I can't do that, therefore you must be lying. It's flawed yeah. and extremely arrogant to go, yeah. someone else isn't capable of exceeding what I do. Yeah, and I think it may be a little bit of bitterness in there as well. I yeah. think, um, but I mean, yeah, when it came to, I saw a lot of those arguments about how, how long it should take you to complete a book, but there, was so, yeah. there, was, there wasn't enough information there. So it was like, I did a four hour book in four days. And then someone mm-hmm. would say, what? That would take you a week at least. It's like, but you don't know how many days you're able to dedicate. You might have a full time yeah. job and can only dedicate 30 minutes a day to it. You yeah. know, you, there's not enough like there's not enough yeah. context there to make an actual statement of that can't be true. No, um, it's like you haven't done your research, pal. Like yeah. for this particular argument or conversation that's being had, you don't have all the facts at your disposal. So shouldn't you be asking before you make a fool of yourself? Yeah, <laughs> I think um, I left. Um, my, I, I've, I've left the majority of uh, the groups. I left one because. When I tried to be funny, and that never goes down well, but they, no. I did uh, when the when back a year or so ago, when it was ma- it was made on the day it was made mandatory to wear a mask in the workplace. Yeah, um, well, I, I work from home, so I, I put a mask on in the booth yeah. and took a picture of me in front of my microphone with a mask <laughs> on, and yeah. then put uh, and then I think the caption was something like, um, "Oh, it affects overall quality, but I'm a sucker for the rules." Like, <laughs> obviously, mean you know that's very funny. I thought it was funny, but all of the comments like, "What an idiot! You can't be doing." that you can't it'll make it sound rubbish it's like would you actually think i would get into the booth and start like <laughs> that's damning on their <laughs> intellect that they couldn't figure out that was a joke i got more i left it up for like about an hour and a half and i looked at the comments and there was about i think there was about 11 comments and one of them was was like got it yeah and then yeah, the rest yeah, of yeah. it was negative like, i'll delete that and i'll leave <laughs> <laughs> good for you you know a lot of the voice actors the audiobook narrators i look up to you know, really successful ones who do projects with IPs that I want to do. Mm. I never see them in Facebook groups. <laughs> and I kind of took me a while to cotton on to that, that I was like, I never see them in there, like <laughs> spending all this time, com- you know, denigrating yeah. other people and having a go or whatever, or passing judgment. They're yeah. just like getting on with work. They're yeah. just being productive. So yeah. yeah, that that certainly taught me a lesson when you're, uh, <laughs> like you said, just get out of it. Sometimes, mm. you know, it's it's better to be out of these places if it's being uh, detrimental to your mental health. I find I think, that, like, the whole you have to suffer to make great art, for me, is nonsense. i got to be very yeah. comfortable to make, yeah. <laughs> to make yeah. good art. Yeah, look at Roald Dahl and his little shed at the bottom of the... Exactly. <laughs> the, uh, but, yeah, I think... I think that's it. I think every now and again, I think it's a good sort of good um, to sort of check in, check in on yourself and check in on your day as well. And just sort of, mm-hmm. sort of think, OK, well, what in my day is bringing me down? What's bringing me up? And then just yeah. trying to eliminate as much as, as that as that negative side as yeah. possible every now and again. 
I've um, started doing something where I... So I've done it for like all my groups now, all my voiceover groups. I've done that just because I'm in an extremely busy period right now. Yeah. So great function on Facebook. Uh, mute this group, mute this person, mute this page for 30 days. So I yeah. mute it. for. Th- if I go through a few and I'm like, don't like that, don't like that. I mute them for 30 days. And if I, if when it pops back up on my feed thirty days later, and I find I haven't missed it at all, I'm yeah. just like, well, I'm gone then. Like, I d- yeah. that's proof. I can, I can run a test to see if this is a value to me, um, yeah. and it doesn't cost me anything. You know, it doesn't mean I have to rejoin or anything. And, yeah. and like, if you're having a rough time in a group, just, it uh, just like mute it for thirty days. And if you feel like you've not lost any valuable learning. Um, or you feel like you're gaining mental health, maybe the you know maybe maybe do the test and see if you really want to be in there anymore. I think that's a, that's a good idea. That's a that's a really good test to do. Um, yeah, I like it. Um, and so just before we run out of time, oh no, um, I know I'm enjoying this. Uh, uh, me too. Before uh, we run out of time, but we'll do a part two at some point if you want. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we run out of time. Have you um, any projects uh, coming up in the future that you're excited about that you can that you can perhaps tell us about? Yeah. So like, I've been doing a run of books that I'm super happy with and super proud of. Okay. I mean, I'm proud and happy of all my books, but mm. I did a book by um, uh, a friend of mine now called Trudy Skies, mm-hmm. um, who is um, a fantastic author called The Thirteenth um, Hour. Um, it's the first in the Cruel Gods series. It's like steampunk meets like high fantasy with like elves in it and um, like demon people and uh, bird people and stuff but in a steampunk setting and it's abs- one of the most ferociously original worlds um that i've ever had the joy of uh bringing to audio um so that's fantastic that's due out soon there's the yeah. sequel to we men of ash and shadow which is work or otherwise one of my favorite books of all time um the hand that casts the bone um the first book is currently in the top 10 of the self-published fantasy blog off uh, run by Mark Lawrence. That's by Holly Tinsley. Um, And so it was a treat to be able to do the sequel. Um, I'm currently working on the eighth book in a series um, called uh, The uh, Spells of Summer, which is like urban fantasy, which I'm a really good fan of. And when you've done eight books in, it's good to get back. And then you had a break. It's good to get back to those characters, you know, and slip those comfy slippers on. Um, And then upcoming, I've also got um, a book by Stephen Saville, who last year was like, had one of the six highest selling, well, for a week or something. I don't know exactly, but one, he took a screenshot of the charts and he was the sixth highest selling audio book there, like five places below Barack Obama. Uh, he's got a new se- <laughs> yeah. He's got a new series called um, the the Confessions of Pervain, which I'm excited about. And then after that, I'm very excited to do um, the first in the Dragon Spirits series, the Iron Crown, which is a big, long, I think yeah. projected to be 17 hour fantasy. Wow. So yeah, that's quite a lot. I've got like 11 books coming out, audio books coming out in the next few months. So I am like so happy that I've got this run of like pretty much all awesome fantasy books um so i'm i'm really of various subgenres so yeah quite a lot coming out that i'm i'm very happy with um you are busy (laughs) i'm very busy i'm working two full-time jobs right now essentially because i'm working on what i'm working on that spells of summer and i also somehow an old friend contacted me from uni masters and he now works at thq nordic and he's like Yeah. Oh, we need some someone to do this job that doesn't exist on the new SpongeBob SquarePants game, and it's about like applying emotions to character animations. So I'm doing that as well. So no, yeah, no <laughs> yeah, I'm a very busy boy at the moment, which is why I'm clogging a um, a pint of cola on this uh, <laughs> on this podcast. So yeah, and also if you don't mind as well, I've had so ma- I intended the sequel to be out, but. Um, it's been so busy work wise i um i do a podcast called bailey's bookshelf which is just like me reading audiobooks for free public domain oh, nice, but like yeah. a lot of um podcast audiobooks i've heard aren't 
the quality that perhaps you might get on Audible. So my first one was War of the Worlds, and my next one I'm doing is Dracula. So if you want some free audiobooks um, to a professional standard, then um, just look for Bailey's Bookshelf. Uh, oh, it's doing fantastic. quite well. So yeah, yeah, those are the the projects I've got coming. That must be a that must be a lot of fun to read some of those books like Dracula and War of the Worlds and things. Yeah. So uh, my inspiration was like, I want to read these books. Why not read them into a microphone and yeah. make a product out of it as well? And I, I'm like, like these are also books that like everyone's heard of, but a much smaller population of people will actually have read. Like, mm. so I was like, well, these are the, these are books that you probably should you feel you should read. Well, now you can have them for free and carry them yeah. around as a podcast. So yeah, that's kind of why I'm doing it. What a great idea. I, I remember... Thank you. I, I think it was Richard Armitage who did the... Um, what's... Uh, uh, Jekyll and Hyde. I yeah, think it was, yeah. I think it was Richard Armitage. I, I think he did one for Audible. I remember yes. listening to that and then coming away thinking, I would love to narrate that book. Yeah. <laughs> like, that would be amazing with the dual yeah. personality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's... Yeah, that's great. So what I'll do is put your links to your social media, your website and Bailey's Thank Bookshelf. You. Um, I'll pop it in the link to uh, link, all the links in the show notes so uh, people can uh, just check that out. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for uh, for for joining me on the show. I feel like we've but scratched the surface. I know. Um, we'll, I'd uh, love to come on again if you'll have me one day. I think we uh, I think we should do like a, a bonus episode or something where we can because um, I had loads of questions about fantasy that I wanted to ask you as well. That'd be great. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, so but for the, for this one, thank you so much um, for dedicating your time. Um, yeah, you know, extremely busy day. Um, it sounds like so. I really appreciate you being able to take the time uh, to chat to me today. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you as well. It's been a joy. You too.